Okay, so welcome back here. We're, we're kind of in the middle of the uh, concentration lectures at the moment, and we're going to develop, obviously, an understanding of concentration and self-talk within sports psychology. And actually, a really um, interesting part is that a lot of, of sports psychologists that I'd be speaking to, people at conferences, etc., would say, I don't like the way that we constantly link self-talk to just being solely uh, responsible or in, in part responsible for concentration within sports psychology, within exercise and performance like that. So what are they getting at there is that actually in most of the older kind of academic books, um, what you would see is that there would be maybe a lecture, uh, there would be a chapter or a lecture on uh, concentration in sport, and then you, what you would have within that lecture is self-talk in sports psychology. But now, um, what we see and what I would believe to be true, um, or a little bit uh, more closely aligned to my own philosophy, because we're never really too sure about what we're doing, and we obviously we've evidence and research, which tends to be debunked after five or ten years. Things I would have learned in college uh, are almost obsolete at this stage. So actually what we see with sports psychology is that it's a constantly evolving um, academic discipline that is striving to get closer to as we say, the hard sciences, the more empirical sciences, the searching and, and, and yearning for the qualia, the deep latent meaning of things. So when we see self-talk in sports psychology in an interesting conversation with an, an Olympic athlete um, and their coach recently, was that when we spoke initially about self-talk in sports psychology, they, like many, many, many other athletes and many other people, have this kind of concept that it's all in relation to positive self-talk in sports psychology. Now, self-talk in psychology is a big, big part of, of where we want to be because we're constantly giving ourselves information. Maybe we're doing that bio, uh, true biofeedback, but we're also doing it when we're doing some sort of self-talk, speaking that in our monologue to ourselves whether it be good or bad and it, hap and it happens quite often now the reason why i've given this introduction the reason why i've given this little interlay is because we need to maybe <clears throat> turn the scope and say well there has to be there has to be a place for some negative self-talk or as we would see in some of the maybe high performance culture books this idea of critical self-talk which again can get us closer to where we want to be the adequate level of arousal in terms of a performance which will then lead to adequate level of concentration you guessed it so let's have a little look here in terms of uh, self-talk and sports psychology and maybe maybe making sure that we don't get too too closely aligned to just thinking from a positive slant now this is something that i deal with at least quite often something that i would do with them uh, quite early uh, when i meet them and i would ask them for at least two three maybe four days including the day of a competition or a performance and including maybe one maybe two training sessions uh, maybe for that day at the end of each day or in little intervals during the day just for them three four days as i suggest that you could possibly in some way be able to write down and keep notes of what you've been saying to yourself and all too often with athletes what i see is that there is a huge amount of negative self-talk now hang on one moment James, you just said that there's a very much a strong place, uh, a niche for negative or critical self-talk as we look at it from this lens. Okay, that's, that's correct, and there absolutely is. But for me, I always think 7 10 split. And I'm not talking about bowling there. What I'm talking about is if we have 70% uh, positive self-talk, talk in relation to maintaining that kind of equilibrium of positivity with the other side that i would say yeah we can call it uh, negative self-talk grand okay we can also call it um critical self-talk but uh, in an interesting conversation with a sports psychologist from the uk and in particularly wales recently they said to me um i like to refer to it as reality self-talk you know 
the idea of not just being overly optimistic, not just being overly pessimistic, but trying to find a positive slant while maintaining some sort of element of, of reality and truth in what happens then again. We see it too often in sport. So, self-talk in sports psychology, it can be a very positive thing. But actually, when we think of that, and we spoke previously in some of these lectures throughout the weeks, throughout the months, throughout the years in some cases, what we find is that actually in those moments, because there may be anxiety, because there may be worry, because there may be concern, that this negative self-talk creeps in and it starts to whisper to us, you know, and when it does whisper to us, it takes our attention away. As you see seen with the lecture on concentration, it results in an attentional shift of focus. A result in attentional shift of focus can have a very, very detrimental effect on our performance. This is a good example of positive self-talk. This is Muhammad Ali, of course. I'm the greatest. And I said it even before I knew I was. So this belief of understanding of where you are and where you want to be. I've got a little video here that I want to uh, just show you. It's very short, but it was a, it's a really powerful one. And it kind of goes through self-talk in a really good, uh, detailed way. And we can be very thankful to, to Swim England for this one here as well. So bear with me, get this video ready. Maybe take a couple of notes and see if you can take something from the video. All right, okay, so let's have a look at this little short video in relation to self-talk uh, for a challenge mindset. Um, Hannah Stahl and then Helen Davis, who do a lot of work, um, they contributed, of course, to the uh, Coach and Myths book as well, which can be very useful uh, for coaches, particularly in sports psychology practitioners. Um, so let's have a look at their little short video. It's a cool little one, um, one that tries to break it down, and it's only two minutes long. Hi, it's Helen and Helen, the sports psychologists for Swim England. The purpose of this video is to explore effective self-talk to help us shape our perspective. The way you talk to yourself is often expressed by the inner voice in your head. This is your self-talk. In each situation, the way you talk to yourself is really important as it affects your perspective, helpful or unhelpful. Remember, you are in control of what perspective you take. It is important to listen to your self-talk. What do you notice about the way you think? Your thinking may be affected by your emotions, which is both valid and understandable. If your self-talk is focused on uncertainty, downsides, worries or frustrations about the current situation of your swimming, we call this type of thinking threat state. Threat state is often characterised by loads of questions with answers that we can't know, is unhelpful and is likely to heighten unwanted emotions. We think this way when we feel that we do not have the resources to cope. So, what can we do to help ourselves when our self-talk is like this? One way to shift perspective and self-talk is to view the situation as a challenge. Athletes who practice challenge state thinking have more success and enjoyment. Challenge state thinking is characterized by focusing on the resources you do have, focus on what can be done, and realizing what is in your control. First, notice your self-talk. Acknowledge if it is helping you or not. Have a go at listing or sharing any self-talk that is attached to unwanted emotion. Second, practice shifting your self-talk. List the things you can and enjoy in this time, and then list your resources. Using steps one and two, fill out the chart. We have started it with some quotes from Adam Peaty. Now complete it for yourself, noticing the shift in self-talk language from threat to challenge. Shifting your self-talk can be done with practice. Learning to shift to challenge state self-talk is a lifelong psychological skill, and we hope that it can help you now. Oh, we've just viewed the video on self-talk there, and some great little um, insights into it, some little nuggets there from, from Hannah, obviously. Um, in relation to some of the positive things that we can do in relation to self-talk and maybe looking towards a more uh, fruitful challenge mindset as they like to call it um, growth mindset challenge mindset there's new terms being thrown on these things all the time but definitely something that we can use uh, going forward as well so the previous section covered a variety of mental internal and external distractions typically present in a competitive environment so self-talk is another potential internal distractor 
though it can also be a way to deal with distractions. Anytime you think about something, you're in a sense talking to yourself. Do not think of the pink elephant. 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 <coughs> yeah, chances are you will think of the pink elephant then again. So what we see here is a uh, ironic rebound theory, something you may have come across in the past. We'll have a look at it here now in the moment, and we'll have a little conversation based off it as well. So the ironic rebound theory, or the white bear effect, sometimes people call it, or the polar bear, and um, try not to think of it. Uh, it will probably come into the forefront of your mind once you do, because we've representation of these things, we've symbols of these things. If we go back to Jerome Bruner, if we think of Vygotsky, um, Bruner, Bruner uh, sorry, Bruner in particular, should I say, had a real element on these kind of symbolic learning states that maybe are not just present in our development cognitive. So, try to pose yourself for this task, not to think of a polar bear, and you'll see that the coarse thing will come to your mind uh, every minute. So, Fyodor Dostoevsky then um, came up with this kind of concept, and again, that if you're trying not to think of something, it will probably bounce to the forefront of your mind. So, again, as the polar bear, you're trying to stay away from it. Uh, social psychologist uh, Daniel Wagner then um, done more extensive research across social psychology in relation to this. Um, so how do we stop these kind of thoughts of it? For a real life example of it, what you could say is, you know, these days a lot of people are going on these fad diets, these diets that are going to affect them, these diets that are going to starve their body effectively. What is a diet? Well, it's starving us of calories that we were seeking. Um, and again, our hunter-gatherer survival um, kind of overlay our evolutionary stance uh, physiologically, psychologically, biopsychologically is still present. So in that sense, what's that telling us? Um, we will probably start to think more about the cupcakes, the delicious cupcakes in that situation. Um, it's not easy to escape this phenomenon. Replacement by association then. So maybe think of a red car or something that's close to it. Um, and when that happens, then it leads to how to deal with the, with these issues as well. Maybe start to journal your thoughts, write them down, become very rational about your thoughts, and um, write about what it is that's causing the issue. Maybe don't be afraid of it because as soon as we become afraid of something, we grow, it grows legs and it develops and then it stays in the forefront of our mind when it probably shouldn't or doesn't need to. If I'm being extensively honest. Speak to a friend or a professional if it becomes overwhelming. Sometimes these things happen and if we've thoughts in our mind, particularly distressing thoughts, they can become overwhelming. And obviously speaking to a friend is very, very different. They will always say the caveat. Friends may make you feel better. Professionals will probably help you get better. So why does this case study illustrate the importance of self-talk for athletes? If we're thinking of don't make a mistake, don't make a mistake, don't make a mistake, the first thing that probably bounces into our heads is making a mistake. So we do have to have a more positivistic, instructional type of approach to this. Self-talk has many potential uses, besides enhancing concentration, including breaking bad habits, initiating action, sustaining effort, and acquiring skills. The process of self-talk in which self-talk functions as between an event and a response is displayed, uh, displayed in the table uh, 161 uh, mediator. Uh, as a relationship shows, self-talk mediating an individual's response to situations to self-talk plays a key role in reactions to the situation, and these reactions affect future actions and feelings. Self-talk can take many forms, but for convenience, we'll categorize it into three types, positive slash motivational, instructional, and negative. Positive self-talk then typically focuses on increasing energy, effort, and positive attitude, but does not carry any specific task-related uh, cue, e.g. I can do it, or just hang in there a little longer. For example, gold medal swimmer David, or sorry, Nelson, the bell has been used, the word now, to motivate them to kick extra hard to certain points in the race. Instructional self-talk usually helps the individual focus on a technical or talks-related aspect of the performance in order to perform, improve the execution. Keep your eyes on the ball, bend your knees, for example. Negative self-talk is critical and self-demeaning and gets in the way of person reaching its goals and can be counterproductive and anxiety-producing. Saying things like, oh, stupid shot, you stink, or, you know, very Americanized things, it does not enhance the performance or create positive emotion. Rather, it creates anxiety and fosters negative uh, self-doubt. This is a really good one. 
Um, really good table. It kind of gives us some insight into where we are in the environment and the events that take place within the environment. It gives us the self-talk or the perception of self-talk. And with self-talk, then again, we have the other aspect of where evaluation comes into it. Um, if we think of a response, a response is probably going to be based off an emotional response. It could be a physiological one. And then if it is that case, then it's probably <coughs> it's probably in many cases going to lead uh, to a behavioral response as well. Um, and, and our response in most cases will be a behavioral one then again um you know that kind of way uh it, it certainly is a big part of it for for people uh to try at least go forward to understand these things then um as best as best or at least as close they can um going forward uh, as well so if we think of it uh, better concentration and optimism calmness ho uh, hopelessness anger and frustration so these are the type of things that can happen with athletes yeah, and when they do happen with athletes how do we bounce back from them too well fortunately studies have revealed that over 60 66 000 thoughts we typically have per day 70 percent of them are an 80 are negative so performers who think positively about these negative events who are usually the most successful and that seems uh you know uh, i would say almost counterintuitive it almost seems paradoxical it almost seems as if it's um a little bit of trying to fill both answers but actually the idea is that we will have these answer these automatic negative thoughts how do we deal with them what way do we react well we can react as i said uh seven ten split for me it is anyway seven seven positive three negative or three critical to create a more positive mindset on a related topic the term ironic uh, processes in sport has shown that trying not to perform a specific action can invariably trigger its occurrence sounds instructions such as whatever you do don't double fault don't double fault now don't throw the ball to the bunker in the lake uh, don't choke they tend to lead to that as well so self-talk and its benefits therefore we should focus on what to do as opposed to what not to do there are many uses of self-talk in addition to enhancing concentration and some centers and psychological aspects of performance such as increasing confidence enhancing motivation regulating arousal levels and improved mental preparation what are centers of on aspect skill itself such as breeding uh, breaking bad habits acquiring new skills initiating action and sustaining effort as well the uses of self-talk are typically motivational or instructional, depending on the needs of an athlete. Interestingly, some research has shown that the athlete makes extensive use of metaphors in the cell. Quick like a cheetah, strong like a bull, and these metaphors, when generated by performers themselves, are particularly helpful. So if you look at uh, Dan Abrams' work on this, he does a lot in relation to picking three or four terms that you use, you know, an animal that you may be closely aligned to almost in that sense. And then some of the kind of concepts around speed, strong, um, you know, there's a show when we were younger, it used to say uh, strength of a bear, uh, eyes of a hawk, so stuff like that kind of thing you're, you're going down the route of. Some people throw their nose up with it and people who maybe aren't open minded maybe set in their ways believe that there's only one way that fits all and, and that there shouldn't be some openness to it but a recent qualitative research has suggested that the content of self-talk can be divided into the following categories the nature positive or negative internal or external structure single keywords like braid and concentrate versus phrases like parquet come on versus full sentences like don't worry about mistakes that occur see the person uh, one talks one uh, to oneself in the first person I, me, or second using you, and task instruction skill phrases like tackle low, keep your head up, versus general instruction like get there fast and stay through the race. The research has found two major functions of imagery, cognitive uh, and motivational, um, of arousal, mental readiness coping with difficult situations and motivation. From such research, uh, we are understanding more and more types of functions of self-talk, which should eventually help us to improve uh, the self-talk of sport and exercise performance. Self-talk and performance enhancement, then. Self-talk and performance enhancement. So how do we do that? <coughs> okay, so let's continue on, then. So what do we see here when we're speaking about, although practic practitioners as well as researchers have argued potentially important benefits of positive self-talk and enhancing task performance, only relatively recent has empirical research corroborated this assumption. Uh, conducted an interesting description, descriptive analysis of audible self-talk, observable gestures that junior tennis players exhibit during competition. 
Several important findings emerge from their study, including the following. More negative self-talk than positive. Self-talk was apparent among the players, and these negative self-statements were mainly displayed after mistake. Uh, B, negative self-talk was associated with poor performance on the court. C, the players exhibit little instructional self-talk, move your feet. And then D, there was no significant association between audible positive self-talk and performance. Thus, this sample of youth tennis players seemed to focus on negative and the self-talk order to undermine their performance. Research using a variety of other like samples, however, has shown that different types of positive self-talk, instruction, motivational and related self-affirmating, uh, can be effective in enhancing performance. These studies have been conducted, for example, with cross-country skiers, um, beginning at skilled and tennis players, sprinters, and then figure skaters as well. Okay, just kind of fl flick through this, because I want to get to this part here, the six rules for creating self-talk performance execution. Keep your phrases short and specific. Use first person and present tense. Construct positive phrases. Say a phrase with meaning and attention. Speak kindly to yourself and repeat phrases often. So let them become a mantra. Let them become part of your repertoire. Let them become part of your performance is what I'd say. And if we continue to do so, if we throw time and effort towards them, if we practice them like we do our physical skills, uh, well, then they become part of our performance in a very positive way with some terrific positive outcomes. Two of the most successful involve thought stopping. Uh, and changing negative self-talk to positive self-talk. One way to cope with negative talk is to stop them before they harm performance. Thought stopping involves concentrating on the undeserved talk briefly and then using the cue or a trigger to stop that thought. You clear your mind. So stop or a trigger like that, snapping your fingers, having a little bit of twine, and then going that way as well. What makes the most effective cue depends on the person. Initially, the best is to restrict stopping to practice situations. Whenever you stop thinking of a negative thought or start, just say stop. Aloud and focus on the task related cue. Once you've mastered this, try staying stop quietly to yourself. Let it become part of your mental repertoire of skills. Negative self talk. There is a particular situation that produces negative self talk. You might want to focus on one performance aspect to stay focused and aware of a particular problem. All habits, they do die hard, so you should practice thought stopping on a continual basis. Um, if I'm moving on now, and if I was to move into this part of assessing attentional skills, say, for example, if I was to do that, uh, what kind of things would I come out with at the end of it? So assessing these attentional skills in line with concentration, in line with self-talk and positive and negative self-talk as constructs of sport, exercise, performance, psychology. Well, let's have a look at what it's telling us. So before trying to improve concentration, you should be able to pinpoint problem areas such as undeveloped attentional skills. And no deference distinction concerning attentional focus that else, uh, uh, external versus internal and broad versus, are very useful in this regard. No deference argues that people have different attentional styles that contribute to differences in quality of performance. Of course, the voice, the test of attentional interpersonal styles, T A I S, still in use today. Okay, different parts have been reviewed and updated, but this is still heavily used. What we like to see is these type of examples that at least players, people can look at and use in their everyday performance. What are we referring to here? I'll never recover from this injury. He didn't take time, just continue the exercise every day. If we skip down a couple of a couple of one or two of them, then we have that serve was terrible or a uh, terrible serve. Just slow down and keep a rhythm and timing. And then they'll never play well in the wind. It's windy on both sides of the court. Just requires extra concentration. So I like these little positive self talk uh, skills that we can always place onto negative self talk things as uh, uh, aspects or statements or sentences negative and positive self-talk the scale is broad and external external overload broad internal narrow focus reduced focus and then internal overload on the right hand side some of the scores are indicating uh, the ability to integrate many external stimuli simultaneously <coughs> and for me <coughs> excuse me um when we're speaking itself uh, talk when we're speaking concentration the key for me overall is this reality is that we need to be able to take in external stimuli simultaneously as taking internal stimuli bio and uh, you know neurological feedback to ourselves that allow us to create these systems this indicate aspects of effective focus and broad external broad internal and a narrow focus 
And these assess aspects of ineffective focusing, external overload, internal overload, and reduced focus. Uh, effective and ineffective, we've done a bit of that already. So if we flick on to the test of attentional and interpersonal skills as a trait measure. We did speak a night efforts test. You could look it up. You'll get it online. It is free to access these days. Uh, it wasn't at once upon a time, uh, but it's worth looking at. And I just want to get onto this uh, psychological slash physiological measure. So things have gotten much more detailed these days than they've been in the past. We have an electrocephalogram, uh, which is obviously studies its brain activity patterns of pistol and rifle shooters and archers. That typically assess pre-shot. One consistent finding that accuracy of shooting performance tends to be associated with alpha frequencies, usually linked to relaxed wakefulness in the left cerebral hemisphere so now what we're finding now what we're saying now now what we're realizing with it all is that there's actually a really good bit of detail here in relation to physiological or let's go back to a different slant on it biopsychological the uh, electroencephalogram then is important for us too in particular there's an increase in alpha activity uh, in the left hemisphere of uh, sorry in the left hemisphere in a few seconds prior to releasing the arrow or pulling the pistol trigger this increase of the alpha is, uh, alpha waves activity suggests that uh, elite shooters have gained such control over their attention process that they can voluntarily reduce cognitive activity in their left hemisphere. So there's almost an automated section of this. This in turn can lead to lowering uh, of task irrelevant cognitive distractions that might otherwise disrupt shooting performance. Again, I look back in this and I think, yeah, okay, people will scoff and say, well, why are we looking at something 1995? Because this is the first insight to give us a, a reality-based learning around this. We have big clubs all over the world spending thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars, euros, uh, you know, pounds on these new soft software updates, these new software applications for people to do cognitive training, cognitive load training, uh, distraction stimuli training, all of these different things. But this was the force of its real kind that really said, okay, for the first time, and maybe in a, 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 a pioneering effect of it, is actually what we see here is amazing because what it allows us to do is finally we can be part of that objective sciences, we can be part of that physiological science, and we can start to really look at it in a more... Um, as I always refer to, hard science cue. We don't want to be part of the soft sciences, nor do we need to worry about being part of the soft sciences if we can create objective measures. The more research that we can do around objective measures in sport and exercise, clinical, or cognitive, any of the types of psychology, uh, then it gives us an opportunity to be able to, at the bare minimum, be able to have that conversation about proper empirical research, research that is accurate, research that has an understanding and a level of understanding, and that's why we need to be able to do that as well. That side of it, important, vitally important for me as well, and it's it's one that we need to be aware of going forward. So, look, these are all uh, major, major contributing factors, moving parts, but parts that need to be kind of uh, within your research if you're going to go down that route of studying psychology and wanting to do research papers as well. Heart rate monitors and measures are similar. The notion that heart rate is related to attentional process stems from work in the 60s. Um, explained that deceleration in heart rate during propriety period in June was caused by the shooters directing their attention outward at the time focus not on the visual target but also the best way to stabilize and align the gun so multi multi levels of stimulation okay so let's move on to tips for improving concentration on site memory attention focus speed creativity and flexibility <laughs> 